some little purple belt strangle me out or something because there isn't any ego in any dojo or in any style. Hey there, how's it going, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 552, with my guest today, Mr. John Molyneux. I am Jeremy Lesnick. I am your host. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and I love martial arts. And that's why everything we do here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean? Well, if you want to know what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn about all of our projects and our products. Products are in the store. If you buy one of them, you support the show. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you get 15% off. What a deal. Everybody wins. Our show has its very own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes every week. And if you haven't been to that website, you should check it out. We're constantly improving it. And the goal of the show, well, we're trying to connect and educate and entertain all of you traditional martial artists. And we've been doing it for five and a half years. And there are no plans to stop. So thanks for your support. If you want to help the show, if you want to give back to the work that we're doing, well, you've got a bunch of ways, and I'm going to name off of some of them right now. You could make a purchase. You could share an episode. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick, everywhere you could think of. You could tell a friend about what we're doing. You know, point them to an episode, point them to the website, something like that. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. We've got a bunch of them. Some of them are based on podcast episodes. Some of them are not. You could also leave a review on Facebook or Google or in the places that you listen to podcasts. If you've been listening to this show for years and you've never left us a review, please, please take a few minutes. Do it. It helps other people find the show. Or last but not least, you could support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you get access to at least some of it. The more you contribute, the more we give you access to. Just one of the ways that we help offset the cost of this show. This is not inexpensive to produce. Today's guest has done a lot, and he's been all over the world doing it. And now he's here on Martial Arts Radio to talk to me, and you get to listen to it. He's a fellow podcaster. He has trained in a variety of martial arts, and he tells some pretty great stories. There's a tremendous amount of discipline in this man, and I think that that comes through loud and clear as we hear him tell his story. So here we go. Mr. Molyneux, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It's an absolute pleasure. I love to talk martial arts whenever I get the chance. Me too. And, and this way I get to you know, do it as part of my job. I get to get to expense a whole bunch of things and say, no, no, I, it, this is a business. <laughs> yeah, it is good when you can, when you can live like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think we're in, in the midst of this kind of, I'd almost call it, golden age, or maybe not golden age, but this kind of transition. When, when we talk about the golden age of martial arts, most people think of the, the 60s and the early 70s. But I feel like we're, we're in the next 10 years, I think we're coming to that next era as people start to realize, you know, martial arts is, is such a powerful tool, given what's going on in the world. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always been kind of sort of appreciated, especially with like youngsters and, and getting kids disciplined and stuff, especially with your traditional martial arts. But yeah, I think I think it's kind of growing with with like adults now, isn't it? Like with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu is taking off, hasn't it? So everybody wants a piece of that, don't they? And uh, yeah, yeah it, it's it's good. I mean, to me, it doesn't really matter which art it is because they've all got they've all got their own unique uh, things that are appealing about them. So as long as you're getting involved in anything, I, I don't like the kind of cattiness that you do tend to find between Ugh. certain arts and stuff. I, I'm really not a, with all that. I think as long as you're studying any discipline, uh, it doesn't really matter. I'd rather have anybody training in the worst martial arts school than not at all. Absolutely. And it's, at course. least they're learning something and maybe they'll they'll decide to go somewhere else and get better. Of course, yeah, yeah. It's like the way, I, the way I look at it as well. It's not the actual art; it's the instructor. I mean, you can have a really good instructor in Muay Thai, and you can have a really bad instructor in Muay Thai. Whereas you, can, do you know what I mean, it doesn't sure. really matter about the art itself. It's, it's a lot of it's down to the instructor. Now, what about your start? When, where, how, why? You know, what was what was your first experience with martial arts? Well, funny enough, I mean, I was very much into the the films, the movies when I was young. Like, uh, I was an 80s kid, so it was all the Van Damme films and uh, 
well, I like people like Arnie and stuff like that. But yeah, Van Damme was very much a, a big thing at the time. So it was all, I used to watch all of his films like Bloodsport and Kickboxer and all them kind of ones. Uh, but I actually went to a karate class when I was really young, but I didn't, I think what it was, I, I just watched the older kids fight. It was supposed to be, I think it was like, you had the older kids fight, uh, do the session, and then the younger kids were after that. But I just seen all these bigger, bigger kids and, that, and I thought, oh, I don't fancy doing that. So I never actually took it up. Uh, that's when I was really young. My dad took me to a class. I thought, no, I'm not interested in that. But then when I got a bit older and I, I did a bit of military time and then I took up the boxing, just a traditional boxing in, in the army. And then after leaving the army, that's when I kind of got the bug again. I thought I need to get my teeth into a bit of discipline. And so I was doing uh, bits and bats of stuff. Uh, I dabbled a little bit in Muay Thai, but then I fell into karate. Uh, and then I, did, I was doing karate for many years and teaching it. I was a sensei for, for a while. I was teaching Gojiru and Shotokan. Now, you brought up military service, and for a lot of people, enlisting is the first time that they really get experience with some, some whether you call it martial arts or combatives, however you term it, but you took up boxing. Was it, was it the exposure, the forced exposure, as opposed to a kid when you said, ah, I don't want to do that? What was it that made you say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to box by choice? Well, it was it was one of them things in the military. They, they kind of really push you into anything like any kind of sport any kind of, uh, yeah, sort of martial art, anything like that. If, if you kind of show a bit of initiative and, and a bit of like kind of uh, passion for it, then they really do push you in, in that, that direction. Also, you used to get a little bit of a few perks as well. If you're in the boxing team, then you'd, you'd get the, the best, uh, you get the first dibs at the, the meal times and stuff like that, get all the best healthy food and stuff like that. So that was always quite appealing Ooh. as well. What, what was the reasoning on that? I, I haven't heard that before. Well, like I said, because the army is so kind of uh, behind any sports and, and really do kind of push you in that direction. If, if you get into sport, any kind of sport when you're in the military, that you're kind of like the golden boy or the golden, the golden boys or the golden girls even. So you really do get looked after. So they're, they're just willing to dangle whatever carrots they can to get people to do extra. Pretty much, but I used to like it. I mean, you were up at six in the morning, you were doing the, the hill sprints and that kind of thing. I used to, I just used to thrive on that kind of thing. All right. So, what did you think of the boxing? I, you know, I, it clearly stuck with you in some way, but I'm, I guess, why? That that's probably the root of the question. Why boxing over anything else? Do you mean? Or so when when we have people on the show, in my mind, we end up kind of with a timeline. You know, there there's a there's a genesis of martial arts interest, which for you was movies. Yeah. But you weren't ready, and then something happens, either before or during or maybe after your time boxing that, that flipped a light switch because people don't just go off and train in a bunch of martial arts and teach them willy nilly. Something happens that makes you say, this is a thing that is now part of me and I, and I need to indulge it. Yeah. And I'm curious where that came from. Well, yeah, I, I know what you're saying now. I mean, the, 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 the boxing that I used, I, I really channeled into that because I used to be get involved in fights as a kid. Anyway, I was a bit of a scrapper, you know, in the street and all that kind of thing in the pub. Uh, so that the boxing was good for me in the military because it kind of gave you that discipline and that kind of bit more, bit more respect and that kind of thing. But once leaving the military, I kind of lacked the discipline. I was, I was kind of back into civilian life and not really having any direction. And then, like I said, I did the odd class and, and everything, bit of, bits of Thai boxing and that kind of thing. And then I kind of stumbled into karate by mistake because there, there was a club uh, in where I live in the Southwest now, and they were just saying, look, we'll teach you to be instructors. But part of that was to build their classes. So I'd go out knocking the doors. So it was a door knocking situation, but I'd, I also got the free karate training as well. So that it was kind of tied in together. So that was where the, I, I, I kind of lacked the discipline that I was missing from the military. So I focused and dedicated my, my, my efforts into that. And you recognize that martial arts would provide that for you. Hundred percent. You, you it, it sought was, it out it, for that reason. It, 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 yeah, it was. It was. It was obvious that that that's where I would be able to get some discipline from. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Okay. All right. So you, they really sent you out knocking on doors to recruit martial arts students. Absolutely. Yeah. That it, sounds it, a, it, sounds a bit. And and uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful. It sounds like the the cliche that we would see in a TV show of a cult. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> well, I'm, actually, I can't be sure that it wasn't. But well, yeah, it, it was right. OK, well, if you want to join, you've got to go get 10 friends well, to join and then you can join and then we're going to get them. Right. Well, that the, are multi-level marketing. The, the theory behind it, and it, it was actually 
true was was that you actually got the people skills and the sales skills uh, when you were out tapping the doors, and then they transferred over into the classes because you, in a way, once you once you're teaching to try and keep the keep the students and and have the relationships with the with the parents and keep that kind of thing going, you've already overcome these objections and stuff that that you were seeing on the door. They kind of cross over into the dojo as well, so it, it does def- kind of set you up for for the for the actual. Uh, public classes if you want to put it that way makes a lot of sense now you said you ended up teaching karate i heard goju and and what was the other one you Shotokan. it's just kind of goju yeah yeah uh so you stuck with it for a bit yeah i mean unfortunately jeremy it, it came to the stage where it just wasn't making me any money uh the, they had x amount of of sensors that were under underneath the, it was a little bit like a pyramid scheme you had the two wrenches at the top so they were like four fifth downs and they did all right for me because obviously they, they were covering quite a large part of the country, like the Southwest. So they, they had quite a lot of uh, instructors underneath them. But me in, in, a, in a small area of Cornwall where it's not very built up, I mean, they had uh, instructors in, in the city like uh, Plymouth and places like that. So you've got more um, people, more kind of, uh, but where I'm living, it's kind of a bit more sort of, she would say lesser populated and stuff. So to, to get the big classes is, is more tricky. So for me, the only reason I threw the towel in is, is because it wasn't making me any money. It wasn't, um, she would say, yeah, it just wasn't able to make me a living. Yeah, like, it wasn't like economical. It did, yeah, like it did with some of the others. But I mean, I stuck it out and got my sh- uh, on Hall. That's what I wanted to achieve. I didn't want to walk away with, with a purple belt or even a, a, a you know, in a third queue or anything like that. I wanted to get that short on horn. And the, the fact that I achieved that, and I thought, well, at least now I know I've done that. It, I can I can take that off and and kind of, that's that's where I got to with my karate days. So, so you leave that program, you've got some, some black around your waist, you're feeling good. And then what was the next step? That's a good question because, I mean, the, the passion of the martial arts is never going to go, but I thought, well, the, my karate journey is over now. So, then I sort of branched back into, well, what do I do now? Where do I take this now? Because and I still had the competitive urges and stuff like that, but it's like, well, other arts, not necessarily about the grading. So I've, I've dabbled with a bit of uh, Wing Chun and stuff. Never did any grades, but just just tied a little with it. I do like to do my own Qigong stuff at home and, and nunchucks and stuff like that. So I tend to do my own stuff as well. Uh, so I do really like the, the kind of... Uh, flowing arts of the Chinese, like the the Tai Chi and the, the Qigong and that kind of stuff. So I do a lot of that. But I'm also really into Muay Thai. I competed a few years ago. Uh, I went back up north. Uh, I fought a couple of times. I did I did traditional boxing fights up north uh, for a friend of mine. He's got a, his own uh, show called the Birth Fist Boxing Show. Uh, it's bare knuckle boxing, basically. But uh, we, we've actually legalized it over here. You can get licensed for bare knuckle boxing again over here uh, mm. in the last few years. Mm. So I, I actually competed in that. What, what the uh, the style is called. Have you heard of left way with Dave LaDuke? I have, actually. Yeah, well, we actually got that, managed to fight that. In, in over, he, his show was the first show in the UK. So I, I, actually, I was actually the first person to fight left way on British soil. Me and, oh, wow. me and my opponent were the first first people to fight it. It was quite cool because it it, it was it was unusual because it's very much like Muay Thai, but you you do fight bare knuckle and well you do have hand wraps, so you have have wraps, but uh, you can actually headbutt as well, which is a very unusual concept. So it does take some getting used to. I don't think any of us managed to to land the the, the headbutts in there, but uh, I think one of us might have tried. But yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a fun fun style. So the the, the first one and. I know, I know the term, and I've looked it up before, but I can't remember. How do you spell that? Lethway is L E T H W E I. Okay, and there, there may be people out there who want to, who want to look that up, and, and I'm going to write it down as well. Make sure we get that in the show notes. And so you're doing that. You're doing your boxing, and I heard you say Muay Thai. It, it the the. The competitive side, I mean, that wasn't part of the story that, that we heard from you earlier. Was this something that, have you always been a competitive person or did this just kind of pop up one day? Uh, yeah, I've always been sort of kind of competitive. But the, the, the thing with martial arts, what I like about it the most is you compete against yourself. For me, I compete against myself more than anybody else. It's not so much my opponent because I don't, I'm not, I have no fear of losing. So that, that doesn't bother me at all. I'm competing to, to mm. better myself. Okay, that makes sense. And how did those fights go? 
they went really well. Uh, they, unfortunately, I lost the the Lethwith fight, but it was a little bit naughty, really, because he he was a, a an ogre basically. He he was he was a lot heavier than me, and he was supposed to lose quite a considerable considerable amount of weight before the bout. And uh, he didn't, <laughs> to be honest. So, uh, yeah, it got to the weigh-in and he was kind of like seven kilograms heavier than me, which is quite a considerable amount. That's probably like two weight weight categories. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a good fight. And the first round, I was kind of all over him because I was getting some good good punch punches in. But he his kicks were phenomenal. He, his legs were like tree trunks. And by the second or the third round, he was dropping these bombs, these kicks on me, and I just couldn't, my, my legs were black and blue, and I ended, I threw the towel in, but mm. it was a good fight. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's a considerable weight difference. People that, that haven't really fought, and, and, and I'm, I'm included, but I've, you know, I've, I've gone hard with some people who are bigger than me. You know, it doesn't matter. Skill, skill will get you far, but yeah, they, they've weight, got more weight, mass behind yeah. those hands and those feet. <laughs> Absolutely, weight and and power is is a big factor. That's why they have weight categories, isn't it? Because it's you have an, you have an unfair advantage if you're half a stone heavier than somebody. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you still competing? Is that still? Well, I mean, I, I don't know anybody's competing right now, but well, COVID uh, aside. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You, you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, the, there are certain things you can do, but it's it's slowly getting some normality back to it. I'm not going to start wearing any kind of uh, masks doing anything or anything like that. But I, I, uh, I think there is some local um, boxing classes going on and stuff, but it, it, it's kind of, because we've had such a big gap, it's that kind of getting back into it, isn't it? It's, it's very tricky and a bit, bit of a sort of challenge to kind of dust yourself off and get, get the wraps back on, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly not easy to pick it back up after it's been put down mm, mm. for so long. And, you know, maybe you're a good person to, to speak to that a bit because you've had some of these transitional moments. And, you know, I don't think there's any time that's more difficult to start training again than not only after you haven't been training for a little while, but really detaching yourself from your former martial arts home. So, you know, when, when you left the karate school and you started doing some of these other things, how did you motivate yourself? How did you decide, you know, this is the day, this is how I'm going to approach it. This is how, you know, where I'm going to go to find my next art or school. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, for me, I've, I've always been quite um, confident in myself and, 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 and friendly and, and open to just, just being uh, a sponge and absorbing new, new information. So I'll go to, I'll go along to a BJJ class on a, a whack a white belt on and, and just be humble and just get on with it and, and ha have some like some, some little purple belt strangle me out or something. Cause there, there, there isn't any ego in any dojo or in, in any, in any uh, style. So I, I've, I've always found it quite easy to, to just adapt and, and, and show the respect to whoever the instructor is. There isn't any ego in any style. I'm assuming you mean inherent in the style that it's the, the ego comes from, from people. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, th yeah, th that's, that's one of the things I was, I was trying to say that it, it, I, I never go into any situation with, especially with a brand new art and a brand, brand new class with, with any kind of ego thinking, Oh, I've, I've had this amount of experience in this style or whatever. You have to kind of, if, if, if anybody of you are who, are, who have got, had a lot a big background in an X style and you, you're looking to try something new, just walk into that dojo humble and, and ready to learn for, with, a, with a clean blank slate. Really? That's, that's what I would uh, recommend. Here on the show, we talk about it a bit as the white belt mentality. And I don't know if you've had the same experience I have, but I love being in the back of the room wearing a white belt, not having anybody expecting me to know anything. I can mess up all I want <laughs> and nobody looks at me funny. They just think, oh, he's a white belt. Yeah, it's, it's great. There's no pressure. In in some ways, I prefer uh, prefer a style or a, that's why I love about a Muay Thai class because you're all you're all equal, aren't you? I mean, I, don't get me wrong. So, some do wear the the banners and they've got the arm bands and stuff, haven't they, to suggest that the X level or whatever. But a lot of the time, if you go into a Muay Thai class. There's no levels. There's no, you're not like in grades, which I do understand with the Japanese martial arts and, and that. And it's all about, uh, because if you look at the old style, that, that's how they used to do it. The, the experienced, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but the, all the experienced black belts were, were nearer to the exit. So that if, if, a, if, a, if a tribe or a, 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 a rival uh, club or a rival karate dojo was going to attack them, they were the first ones to defend the, the dojo. So that's why mm. it's structured in that way. But oh, I oh right, I thought you might. That makes that. sense. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
I, it makes sense to me what the Japanese with the discipline and the grading system and all that. But I, that what I quite like about a Muay Thai class or a boxing class or something is everybody's equal and you can just spar or, or train and, and there's no kind of, oh, well, you're a purple belt, so go and train with that green belt or you two white belts train together. Does that make sense? You can all kind of yeah. mix it up it's a bit. It's just based on, it's just skill. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Skill stands for itself as it would in traditional sports, traditional team sports. You know, I, there's, isn't necessarily there isn't rank on the on the football field, but everybody knows who the the best players are. Yeah, too true, too true. All right. So that's what you has been kind of leading you up to now. So what, what's going on now? You know, I'm, I'm assuming you're doing some training on your own. You've got some stuff that you're working on. You know what's yeah, happening? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I'm doing quite a lot of at the moment is like the the meditating stuff because I keep keep my mind right and everything. I'm very busy with my business though, so I do a lot of because what I, because of the the sales. That's what I do now. Um, I go by the name of Sales Samurai because that's my brand. So uh, what it, the idea of that is, I kind of talk about and blend the, the two together. So I talk about my my uh, martial arts background and I talk about how it helps with sales and how the kind of skills can cross over like the the discipline and the 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 patience so you've got to be patient with prospects you've got to be patient with clients that kind of thing so the the, the two definitely help each other well, we've we've heard your your martial arts background I'm assuming you didn't just roll over one day and say I'm going to start teaching people how to sell there there must have been some sales aspect to your life somewhere along the line well, if you think about it, when I was doing door to door, that that is mm. the that, the door. To, I did five or six years of door to door selling. So that, oh wow, I didn't realize it was that long. That's yeah. So I mean, if you talk to anybody in sales, that door to door is the toughest sales <laughs> yes. sales out there, isn't it? Yes. So the fact that I did it for so long gives me quite a good, um, should we say, um, an expertise, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, that's quite the education. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And. I, I can I can imagine I, I as a kid I had a friend who was selling magazines you know the the kind of standard fare back of the comic book you send out you know with a dollar ninety nine they send you a kit back and you yeah. go around the neighborhood and sell magazines and I went out with him one day and it was one of the most disastrous uh, least productive things I think I've ever seen done you know we had doors shut in our face I mean we're we're kids we're like ten years old uh, people not answering the door and peeking at us through curtains, you know, just all that stuff. Yeah. So I imagine you have some stories like that. I, I wonder if anything big and dramatic happened as you went door to door. Well, I won't say big and dramatic, but yeah, all those kind of things. Uh, I used to get a lot of, we, I don't deal with cold callers. That, that was quite a good one. So you, but what I, I just used to try and make a, make a joke of it or make a laugh of it. Say, so I'm not a cold caller. I'm quite warm tonight. Look, I've got a, a stick jacket on. So, you know what I mean? Just try and lighten the mood and, and, and make a joke of things. But uh, yeah, they used to get the door slamming quite a lot or just, uh, that that is part of the part of the job. I mean, I I, I got to the stage where after like I could only I only, I only had to speak to somebody for like five or ten seconds, and I knew whether they were going to have an appointment or not. So you do get, get some kind of acute senses and, and sales skills from doing it. And those skills are are pretty valuable. You talked a little bit earlier about how those translate over into the martial arts world, but what what about the other way? How does how does martial arts help you selling? Well, again, like I mentioned, the discipline because it, it sales or it, not not even so much sales, but just just business it, it, or entrepreneurship, it, it crosses over to all that kind of stuff. But yeah, discipline and um, patience, like I said, to be patient with people or even perseverance. So just keep do, do it like also repet repetition. So with with your when you're doing studying your karate class, you repeatedly punch. You know you're doing the same kicks over and over again. With the sales, you you're reading the same pitches over and over again, or you you dialing the same numbers over and over again. So there's lots of ways that they, they kind of cross over. So you you've got this this brand this sales samurai. Yeah. And how does how does that manifest? You know what what I guess what are you putting out for people? Well. I've done quite a bit. Well, to be honest, I, I need to work on it a bit more. It's just um, there's, there's obviously so many things that I'm trying to do. Uh, That's actually, a very martial arts inspired statement, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I need to train more. 
<laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, I've put out a little bit of content on my YouTube channel um, with regards to martial arts. What, what I'm trying to do it, with with that was was kind of demonstrations or self defense and stuff like that with with uh, sales tips put in blended into it because you look on YouTube and there's hundreds of thousands of martial arts dedicated channels with with whatever Carly or there's, there's hundreds of stars and. and Good, good YouTube channels, and you've got probably quite a lot of uh, equal amounts of sales tips and sales channels, but you haven't got many blends of the two. So that was my initial idea was to do martial arts demonstrations and, and tips and self defense, but add my sales tips and stuff in there. So that that's I have done a couple of it. I do need to work on that and, and focus some more time on it. But the, the trouble I have with that is as well is a lot of the self defense techniques like grabs and, and holds and locks and kind of things that I could demonstrate, you do require a partner, don't you? And again, with this current climate, it's not ideal for that. So that, that's kind of a project that is a little bit on the back burner. But I am putting together my first book, which is uh, oh, well, The Sales Samurai, How to Get Your Black Belt in Sales. That's that's going to be, I'm putting that together. So I have got loads of different projects around the brand of Sales Samurai, but it's just kind of piecing them all together. I suspect for everybody, listening to this right now if, if i said you know what picture in your mind a black belt you know what that person is even if they train in a style that doesn't do rank in quite that way we all have an, an image in our mind of of who and what a black belt is but what about a black belt in sales i don't think i can if you said what's a black belt in sales look like i don't know that i could answer that so i'm going to ask you what what is a black belt in sales well, you, it's, it's well. I mean, you would say that a, a black belt in karate has mastered or, or got to a, a, a relatively high standard of karate, haven't you? They've they've they've, they've worked on the uh, yeah. kata so that they look really slick. The punches are always in in the right positions. The 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 stances always look good. That kind of thing. So with the with the black belt in sales, you, you'd probably have your your you you brushed upon a lot of different closing techniques, and you'd you'd manage to learn a script or, or a number of scripts, and and you can use them. Because what I do now is I've got to stage where I've learned that many different scripts. I can I can I can read over a script with a, with a, with a, even a new product, and and then I can kind of put my own twist on it within quite a short time. With it within a week, I've I've kind of learned that script and I've, I've put my own uh, personality into it because with reading a script in sales, if you read a script as it is and you speaking on the phone to somebody, they're going to know that you're reading a script. <laughs> does that make sense? Right. So right. you've got to put your own personality into a script. Mm. So that does take some uh, some getting used to. So it, a black belt in sales has, has studied different aspects of the art because sales is an art. And he studied uh, prospecting, how to, how to reach out to people and how, how to build rapport with people. So how are you today? Uh, how's the weather? What have you been up to? That kind of thing. So you, you, you befriending and building relationships. So there's, there's lots of different aspects to it. So a master at a black belt in sales has, has kind of done all these different uh, parts of the sale and, and got mm. to a good standard of it. We've all got our heroes, you know, and quite often on the show, I'll ask people, you know, who what martial artists in your history have been really influential or kind of the opposite who, you know, if you could train with anybody anywhere in time, where, where would, where would that go? But I, I want to twist that question a little bit for you. Imagine you have the opportunity to sit down at dinner with a hero of yours from the martial arts world and a hero of yours from sales, marketing yeah. business. Oh, wow. and the three of you get to have this chat and, okay, and, you know, okay. a, a great meal. And and let's pretend there's even a time machine involved. So you know, we can grab them from wherever if need be. Wow. Who would you be having dinner with? That's a very good one. I mean, there was, um, uh, there's a couple of martial artists who I would really like to see that with. One is Miyamoto Musashi. I think I've got the name right. He did yep. the Book of Five Rings. That that would be just phenomenal because he he was such a uh, an incredible guy. Because if you look at those old samurai types and and the old even even the old Chinese masters and stuff, they they didn't just do martial arts. They were they were calligraphy and they were they were artists. They were poets. They were poets. They were they were sort of phenomenal in 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 multiple arts, weren't they? So mm -hmm. I'd be fascinated to to sit down with him. Bruce Lee would be another phenomenal one. So I, I'm being a bit cheeky now. I've, I've chosen two martial artists. But <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, with regards to a sales guy, I think uh, there'd be a couple actually. One still living, and that would be 
Mr. Brian Tracy because he is phenomenal and he always has been, but he's not just good at sales. He's good at all sorts like uh, uh, speaker. He's, he's a professional speaker. So he's just a really talented guy. So he'd be one and uh, possibly the late great Zig Ziglar. He was another phenomenal mm. salesman. Yes, he was. Yeah. And so let's, the of, of the names that you you just dropped, yeah. Bruce Lee is probably the more more common martial arts <laughs> yeah, figure. Yeah. Zig Ziglar is probably the more common business or motivational speaker figure. Yeah. So let's imagine you're sitting down with with Zig and Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> what a combination! <laughs> I know what you, I, I've got some sense as to what you would talk about with them. What do you think they would talk about each about with each other? What do you think? What questions? Let's let's assume they knew who each other was. Yeah. What questions would they be asking? I, it wouldn't surprise me if they did. <laughs> to be mm. honest, they, they could have done, couldn't they? Um, I don't know. Maybe they, maybe if they 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 would have had some similarities and, and um, similar sort of discussions as to as to what I would I would with them kind of. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's quite a difficult question. I, I, I'm I'm struggling a little bit with that one. That's okay. That's okay. If you come up with an answer later on, you know, just. Just let me know. We'll yeah. we'll throw it back in. Yeah, you know, yeah. Conversation doesn't have to be completely linear. One of the things that I I know about both gentlemen is that they they craved more information, more knowledge. They were always looking for who can I talk to, who can I study with, train with, what can I learn to enhance what I have now. Yeah. And I wonder if they would rather quickly end up at sort of an intersection between sales, business, you know, motivation. Uh, it's really, it's all, it's all under the heading of communication. Yeah. You know, it's just communication with a different focus and martial arts, physical training. You know, they, I think they would probably end up there fairly quickly, which is, you know, pretty similar to what you've got going on, you know, trying to blend the two and, yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, because I've got I've got a feeling that Zig would have probably looked after himself. So I'm sure Bruce could have showed him a few one inch punches or or a few kicks, and uh, <laughs> yeah, vice versa. I'm, I'm, uh, I know that Bruce was a bit of a philosopher, so they'd, they'd definitely be able to speak on a on an intelligent level. So I think that's probably where we'd, we'd get to. They'd, mm. they'd probably be trading trading blows, or maybe not maybe not trading blows, but <laughs> I reckon Bruce would be showing him a trick or two, and uh, maybe maybe Zig could teach him a few verbal verbal. Um, verbal attacks or ver verbal challenges i suspect so yeah that the both men i mean obviously everybody listening knows who bruce lee is you know here we are close yeah. to 50 years later still the most influential martial artist on the planet and i don't know if everyone knows who zig ziglar is but i guarantee zig ziglar influenced a lot of the people that everybody listening today looks up to i mean just absolute, an absolute yeah. force mm-hmm mm -hmm. In, in what he did. Now, everything we've talked about today has been really positive and, and uplifting and constructive, and we're just going to take a hard left here. Okay. Martial artists have a, I don't know if I want to call it a unique ability, but a better than average capacity for overcoming adversity. Yeah. I'm sure at some point, something didn't go right for you. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you might tell us about that and how your martial arts be it physical or emotional, mental, spiritual, you know, how, however you define martial arts in that context was able to help you through the situation. Well, yeah, I, I can think of, of, of one um, situation, but I don't know whether I could put it down to the, the martial arts or the military. It could be a mixture of the two, but uh, I did find myself homeless for some uh, a while when I came out of the military and, uh, that that was a, a real challenge, and I really had to sort of dig deep and and sort of, do you know what I mean? Really, really kind of uh, battle the demons to get get out of that situation. Because uh, unfortunately, that it does happen with a lot of ex-military personnel that they find themselves in that that kind of situation. Luckily for me, though, it wasn't uh, for any length of time, and I wasn't kind of really destitute and on the streets, if you put it. It was kind of more like sofa surfing and not really having to fix the board. So it it was even though it was close to to full-blown homelessness uh it wasn't actually if that makes sense so that's probably the most challenging one of the most challenging life situations i've found myself in but uh 
I think when you've had this kind of mentality and the the, the this uh, discipline and and the, the gives yourself that strong will and everything, doesn't it? It's kind of pushed through the challenging times, I guess. It does. You know, you you you're almost a little dismissive of it, um, and probably out of deference to people who had or, or have worse situations than maybe you had endured. But I, I can't say that I know what it's like, regardless of, of all the things that have gone wrong and been difficult in my life. I know where I'm hanging my hat that night. Mm, mm. And it's the same place I was hanging it last night. And it's going to be the same place I hang it tomorrow. And there's some, there's some structure, there's some comfort in that. Yeah. So to not have that, to not have that, that one place, uh, that that's, that's gotta be rough. Well, it, it is, but if you think about it, it, it you kind of, you kind of uh, acute to that that kind of feeling anyway. Because when you're in the military, you don't have that kind of that home feel about you anyway. Mm. That you you kind of used to that. So the the fact that I was I was homeless quite soon after that that military experience in my head, it wasn't really anything to to concern myself about because I've, I've been living in barracks and 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 tents and stuff for for however, however long it was. So. Does that make sense? Your, your soldier yeah. mentality it, it overrides that having a home kind of thing. Hmm. Other than boxing, what did you do in the military? Did you? Uh, what was your your job? I guess. Yeah. Well, I was, the, the funny thing was, I actually went in with the idea to to do a trade, and I was uh, I was actually what you call a signals in the signals. It's that's a, a British regiment. I don't know whether it's like if I guess in the states it would be some kind of communication. Uh, battalion or regiment or sure. whatever you call it over there but that the, the, the ironic thing was i wish i'd have just gone in and done uh like paras parachutes or, or tanks or something like something fun and, and really so, toy soldiers kind of stuff because i never used any of the any of the skill the qualifications that i got from that particular trade when i came out anyway so i might as well have just had a bit of fun when i was in there but <laughs> it's one of them things i suppose mm. any good stories from your time in Oh wow! I love good stories. Yeah. Anything you you have clearance to tell us about? Go on, I can tell you about this one time. We we me and this lad went partying in in Berlin, and it got really messy because over there you could literally stay in these nightclubs all night. They'd just stay open all night, and I mean all night. So like literally, we left this place at like I think I'd lost him anyway. There was only two of us, and I'd lost him at some point. This is this was like a I think it was like a two hour, two hour train journey away from where we were based, and. um I, I got back to this the train station in an absolute state on my own, jumped on this train. And what I didn't realise was this this train, it went on a massive, well, it stopped where I was going, but it carried on and went round in a huge circle and then, and then came back to the same train station four hours later. I fell asleep on the train and then woke up <laughs> and got off at the exact same train station four hours later and had to repeat the process. So, oh. yeah, that, that was uh, one of the funny, funny things that happened out there, but... I think we can all imagine that. I think, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, I, I feel like we just had somebody on the show not long ago talking about um, falling asleep on, on a school bus. Yeah. Yeah. It's easily and, done, uh, isn't it? Especially if you've yeah. been partying all night. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, no, no judgment here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, to be honest with you, it was part of the thing. It was part of the culture when you, when you, I mean, when you're, in the, when you're a soldier, you, you drink a lot it was part of the, the culture to drink heavily and smoke a lot as well. I don't smoke at all nowadays, but it was because you were so fit, you were, you were a bit like, you just thought you were unstoppable. So we used to, mm. obviously a bit younger as well. So we used to smink, drink and smoke like chimneys like, but um, not anymore, not these days. A lot, it's lot, it's lot an calm. intense environment. And I would imagine that yeah, having those vices is, you know, uh, maybe not necessary, but a, a powerful yeah, if any, release. It definitely was, definitely was. Mm. Mm. All right. So what else? What else? I've been I've been driving this. Would this this is this is your chance to start driving? You hop in the you hop in the seat. What should we just here? Where 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 are we going? What haven't we talked about that we should talk about? Well, uh, I don't know. What what? Let's talk about your a bit more about your martial arts background. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's. You know, my, my stuff's been been documented pretty well, but you know, I didn't have the that experience you did of of not wanting to do it. I just I honestly I don't remember a time when I wasn't training. No. And I started so young and it was just it's it's always been a thing that I've done. Mm. It's it's the 
it's the it's the root it's it's my it's my home base it's the thing that if i have nothing else i know i can fall back on that absolutely i'm pretty fortunate in that way it gives me a chance to talk to people all around the world like you well one of one of my passions is is the actual weapon side of things as well maybe that stemmed from the military a little bit but I love having a stick in my hand or, or sort of blades and that kind of thing. How about yourself? Do you like to do like sea lot or anything like that? Or? I don't have nearly as much experience as, as I do with empty hand work, mm-hmm. but I do. I do. So where did, where did you pick up the stick and, and blade? You mentioned Nunchaku earlier. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that, funny enough, when I, when I, one of the first uh, uh, different parts of the UK, they tend to find kind of, you, you find different arts that are quite kind of popular. Where I'm from originally was the Northwest, and that's very much like Muay Thai uh, and wrestling. There's a lot of kind of catch wrestling. I think that's took off a bit over there as well. Catch wrestling is catches. It's uh, trying to. Catches catch cam wrestling is actually a traditional Lancashire. It's, a, it's an old school Lancashire um, style. And I think it's taken off over there as well in, in recent years uh, but in different parts of the country so I lived in the south east for a while and that was very much Aikido and uh, like a, a black belt second or third Dan came one day with some uh, the you know the staff and I was doing a little bit of staff and I'd never done it before and he says well, you take this really quite well so I'm like all oh, right cheers you know what I mean so I, I, I kind of sort of uh, when I get a weapon in man I, I seem to be quite sort of natural with it if that makes sense so yeah so it kind of stemmed from that a bit I thought yeah I quite like this stick stuff and I've always fancied doing a bit of kendo as well but that seems to be quite uh, t- tricky to find doesn't it so I've always liked the idea of having sticks and swords and knives and stuff like that so mm. yeah the, the like you said the nunchuck I do like like to to do a bit of nunchuck work one of the things I like about a stick, you know, regardless of the length, is you can find something pretty much anywhere. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you, you know, most of us aren't walking around with a sword or a bow. Uh, you know, I don't know anybody that carries tonfa, but you know, I can pick up a broomstick and do eighty percent of what I would do in a in a bow form. With yeah. it, I can pick up a, I don't know, something something shorter. You know, a Swiffer duster. You know what those are? You know the oh the knuckle duster. Uh, oh yeah, I've had to see on a few. Uh, no, no. Uh, over here, Swiffer's a, oh. a a a cleaning thing. It's like a short broom and oh and sorry, I change out the pads. Knuckle just, duster. Then. No, don't don't. I mean that you, there isn't much translation you have to do to convert that into a weapon. That's just that's right there, ready to go. <laughs> yeah. you know, like like a short broom, like a hand broom. You know, yeah, like I got you. Yeah, something yeah. like that. You can you can turn anything into a weapon if you understand the principles, and yeah. that's what I like about sticks. Is they're they're simple. Well, you 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 have to think about having a, a a pocket full of change. That could be a weapon, couldn't it? If if you're in a, if you're in a self defense situation, just throw some coins in someone's face. They're going to know about that, aren't they? Right, right. I any any time you watch a a kung fu movie or and and they're on a beach, you know inevitably somebody's getting sand, sand in thrown in their eye. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know about you, but I know how much it hurts to have a grain of sand in my eye yeah. when I go to the beach, let alone a face full of it. Uh-huh. I mean, just something so simple, so readily available, and so debilitating. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of karate. That's what I like. A lot of the self-defense techniques are so effective and, and simple. Like I like a you know like a shin grind. So you just just run your run your foot down down the shin. That is so my favorite. exasperating yeah. and, and, and painful, but it's so simple to do, isn't it? It is. And you know, I w- when I teach self-defense, that's a great example of the stuff that I teach because anybody can do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It doesn't require committing to murdering the person trying to hurt you in order for it to be effective. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's a really, really strong deterrent and then hopefully you can run away. Absolutely. hundred percent. I also a big fan of uh, one of the things that I miss about karate was like breaking all the boards and stuff like that. It used to be quite a lot of fun. Did you have a favorite setup, a favorite technique that you would use for breaking? Um, well, we used to punch through roof tiles, um, but I, I used to, I used to quite like, uh, the conditioning. So I'd, I'd, I'd like karate chop things quite a lot, you know, so, so to sort of harden up your, your, your kind of your hand and stuff like that. So mm. I, I used to like a, quite a lot of conditioning. There are, there are certain things I miss about the karate training, actually, but, um, you do move on and adapt and change what you're doing as you get, especially as you get older. I'm not as flexible as I was. So like them high karate kicks are <laughs> not happening at the moment. <laughs> Do you think you'll go back to it? The, the way you're talk, you've said, I think three or four times, you know, the way you've spoken of karate, it sounds like you miss it. 
Yeah, I do miss it, but I, I don't think I'd ever go back to it. No, because it, I, I've got, I, I achieved what I wanted to from it, and I, I'm interested in other other styles and everything. Now. So yeah, even though it was my foundation, I, I still, I'd probably still use some of it if I, if necessary as well, because it, it's ingrained in me. So if I was in a self defence situation, it, it might just come out without even thinking about it. But uh, as mm. far as going back into it studying wise, I don't think I would. No. Okay. All right. Because you've been there, done that, and there's other stuff that you haven't been there and done that well exactly i mean i, I i'm i'm interested in, in other stuff so like i said I, I like to kind of mix things up nowadays i've got my filipino stuff i've got like the Quran bits and stuff like that and i, I do like to toy around with those things so yeah I, as far as uh going back to it i don't think I ever would but i've taken from it a bit like bruce lee said you've got to dis- uh, keep whatever you feel is is uh mm-hmm. helpful discard what it's not so i've taken what i wanted from from my years of training in it and and that's it i think yeah well, you told us a little bit about the book that you're working on, and I find that most authors have authors that they like. Are there any martial arts or sales or, I guess, books in general that, that the listeners might appreciate a recommendation? Yeah, well, funny enough, going back to the karate, I did have a, a couple of really good karate books, actually. One was Hojo Undo uh, by Michael Clark. Um, uh, I can't think what the other one, but there was both by him. They were very good karate books. And then you've obviously got Gichin for Nakoshi. He did the yeah. Karate Do Kyohan, I think it's called. So those are good traditional karate books. But I have a kung fu book as well. I can't think of the author. Uh, that you've got the the five star the what did I, what did we say? What, the, five Rings. Yeah, the book of Five Rings, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Mm. That's a very famous book. But that that can help with all kinds of, of uh, not strictly for martial artists, for lots of business people. I, I hear about reading that book as well. So that's that's a definitely yeah. a good read. But uh, yeah, I've got quite. I'm quite a fan of uh, of many different authors. I'm quite uh, open to different. Uh, I don't. I'm not very one tracked with with what I read. I mean, I read like uh, Think and Grow Rich, or yeah, I'm quite open great to. Book. Yeah, yeah, it's I do quite book. like um, some of the. I can't think of what there's a guy called Zechariah Sitchin, and he writes about you know like Aztecs and and Mayans and all that kind of thing. I'm very fascinated by all that you know like the ancient uh, civilizations and that kind of thing. So that fascinates me. Yeah, you were a student of history then. Not so much. Well, I, I used to hate it when I was younger, but it, it does. It, 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 it interests me. <laughs> it sounds a lot like you more. Appre- you have an appreciation for it, though. Now I, I do know. Yeah, in my older years, as, as I'm getting older, I think, wow, uh, are we really as advanced as we think we are? They seem to have known a lot more <laughs> then, don't we? <laughs> so, yeah. Good point. And so let's let's talk about what's coming. You know, you, you told us about some of these things that you're working on, but let's let's take a, a big step back. Let's look out. You know however long you want to look out a year, five years, 10 years more, you know, if we were to come back and, and chat again in this format and I said, Hey, what, what's gone on since we last talked, what would you hope you would be telling me? Oh, wow. That, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, I would like for my, uh, my, my book to be completed and, and obviously it's to sell. I w- I'd want some people to buy it. So hopefully I'll get generate some interest with that. Uh, one of my goals would really be to, I've always fancied the idea of uh, having my own business with to do with martial arts, uh, martial arts related business, i.e. Uh, selling weapons or something like that. Do you know what I mean, I have, have my own kind of uh, business with, with different martial arts weapons or supplies and that kind of thing. I think that would be quite quite uh, interesting. Or, or I reckon I'd enjoy doing that. Uh, and yeah, and just, just hopefully get back into some training, even if it's just sort of my own stuff. But it would be nice to get back to some, some sessions and, start punching some pads and kicking some pads and that kind of thing and yeah get get back to some nitty gritty stuff yeah i i, I miss getting kicked it's the <laughs> yeah. first time in my life where i've really just <laughs> i if i wouldn't even care if i didn't get to kick people i i would go spar and just get kicked right now <laughs> because i miss it that much Oh wow! The amount of times I've done like Muay Thai class, and you've got the you've got the pads up against your legs, and the kicking the hell out. Oh yeah, you walk away all bruised and, 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 and <laughs> limping. Maybe I don't want to get kicked that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just want to get light kicks. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, you've you've mentioned you know a few things your YouTube channel and and whatnot. Where where can people find you? Connect with you online. Yeah, well, drop, drop yeah, those for us? mainly my my sales samurai channel because that that have, that has got a, a mixture of stuff that I put on there. I, I also add some of my uh, um, podcast episodes onto those as well. So. Um, my, my podcast is called the Success Breed Success Show, and that's available on most 
platforms. Now you can get it on Alexa, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple. Uh, but if you wanted to see the actual footage as well, the the, the are uh, videos as well. So I do. I, I've started uploading all the recent ones that are on the YouTube channel as well. So the YouTube channel has got a mixture of some of the the sales tips that I've mentioned and a, a little bit of my sites. It does need some more demonstrations adding on to that. So I'll have to get get me um, yeah, happy with that a bit but um <laughs> yeah so the, yeah and also there's some of the episodes on there as well so that so those are the main things that i promote my uh youtube channel and my uh podcast show well, t- i don't think we've talked about the podcast i mean you before we went live you you dropped a hint to me that you had one but tell us you know wh- what what would people hear when they listen to success breed success yeah, well, the the idea that I had was it's not, it's not strictly martial arts uh, podcast or anything like that. Uh, it's literally pretty much what it says in the title. Uh, I, I noticed like about twelve months ago, I was thinking, wow, it's such a struggle for entrepreneurs, and I've, I've dealt with a lot of coaches and, and like business owners and stuff like. That. It's such a tricky industry to be in when you set up a business or when you when you're trying to be a. a set up a coaching industry like, or, or whatever. You know, what I mean, just diff, different. Um, different challenges that these people are facing. And I thought, well, if I can start interviewing people that are having success in these different, uh, should we say, um, niches and uh, get some tips and guidance from them, then help, help some, hopefully help some listeners out. And so far it's going really well. I've, I've got all sorts of, uh, it's, it's kind of blown up bigger than I expected. I speak to actors, I speak to uh, authors and speakers and millionaires. I've I've had all sorts. Yeah. I actually, (laughs) you like this one. I uh, interviewed Sean Kernan. He was Mike Barnes in Karate Kid 3. Yeah, good guy. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a brilliant episode. Actually, he's on the YouTube channel. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, so yeah, and that was a good chat. I told him about how I've got a dog called Mister Miyagi and everything, and and how, <laughs> how how I was teaching karate. We had a really good chat. So yeah, he, he was he was a fantastic guest, and I've, I've had all sorts of, of amazing guests on there so oh, far. Cool. Yeah. What kind of dog is Mr. Miyagi? He is a sausage Russell. So he's a he's a Jack Russell sausage dog cross. <laughs> I, I'm laughing at the name. I can visualize, and, and it sounds like a, a you know a fun dog, but the idea of calling it a, a sausage Russell like that. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's my name. name for it. I mean, I think I, offic- I think officially it's uh, Jack's Hunt, so it's uh, okay. Jack Russell, Dax Hunt, isn't it? But I prefer sausage Russell. Sounds better. I, far, far more descriptive <laughs> yeah, of the absolutely. animal for sure. Yeah, yeah. I get him doing wax on and wax off, and that you know what I mean. He's... <laughs> awesome. Well, this is this has been a fun chat. And I appreciate yeah, I've enjoyed you coming it. on. It's been a pleasure. And, you know, all guests get the opportunity to, to, you know, send us out to the outro that I'm going to record later. So what are your final words? What are your parting thoughts for the listeners today? All I would say is if there's anything that you wish you'd done before, start doing it. So if you've not took up martial arts yet, go along to your classes or start studying at home. There's plenty of good uh, tutorial things you can see online. Just start having a go at something. It doesn't have to be martial arts, whatever. If, if, if you want to try something out, go and do it because uh, we only get this, these opportunities. Don't you, You're only here once, that's what they say, isn't it? So you might as well make the most of it. Uh, if you're looking to set up your own business or you're, you're tired of your nine to five, why don't you start setting some, I wouldn't say like jump into it and quit your job, but maybe start a side hustle or something. Just, just go for it, follow what you want to do. Martial arts impacts us in every way, every aspect of our lives, whether or not we realize it. The more you train, the more tools you have at your disposal, the more ready you are to face the challenges that life throws at you. And here we go with yet another episode where that becomes abundantly clear. For so many of our guests on the show, martial arts is the lifeblood. It's the thread that connects all the different aspects of their lives. And Mr. Molyneux is as strong an example of that as anyone we've had. So thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. And I hope we get to connect again soon. If you want the show notes with the links and all that stuff that we talked about today, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check it out. Sign up for the newsletter. Look at the photos. Look at the other episodes. They're all there. Every episode we've ever done is available for you there. And if that's enough to maybe squeeze a couple bucks a month out of you, consider the Patreon. Or, you know, you've got other ways you can help us out. You can make a purchase on the store. You could share an episode with somebody, leave a review. It's all good. Anything you're willing to do to help us out, I really do appreciate it. If you have guest suggestions or other feedback, the best way to submit those, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. 
And if you see somebody out there wearing something with whistle kick on it, say hello. Talk to them. Find out how they found out about whistle kick. Maybe you'll make a new friend. That's all I've got for you today. Thanks for coming by. And until next time, you know how it goes. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.